Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome all those who join us on our heritage.org website on these occasions. Uh, as we prepare to begin here in-house, we would appreciate everyone checking that cell phones have been turned off as a courtesy to our guests. We, of course, will post the program on the Heritage website following today's event for your future reference. And I remind our Internet viewers today, as well as in the future, that any comments or questions can always be mailed to us at speaker at heritage.org. Hosting our discussion today is John Malcolm. Mr. Malcolm is the Ed Gilbertson and Sherry Lindbergh Gilbertson Senior Fellow at Heritage, as well as Director of the Edwin Meese III Center for Legal and Judicial Studies. He is also Chairman of the Criminal Law Practice Group of the Federalist Society and serves on the Board of Directors of Enough is Enough. Before joining us here, he was Senior Ca uh, General Counsel at the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, as well as Distinguished Practitioner in Residence at Pepperdine Law School. He has served as an Executive Vice President and Director of Worldwide Anti-Piracy Operations for the Motion Picture Association of America, a Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Criminal Division at the U.S. Department of Justice, a partner in the Atlanta law firm of Malcolm & Schroeder, as well as an Assistant United States Attorney in Atlanta. Please join me in welcoming John Malcolm. John? Thank you, John, and, uh, and thank you to all of you for braving the elements in coming here today. Uh, I would also commend uh, to all of you, by the way, an excellent paper by one of our panelists, Andrew Grossman, which you can pick out out front. And those of you who are watching over the internet, you can get it uh, online, uh, entitled Harris versus Quinn, an end to the forced unionization of home care workers. Uh, we have an excellent panel here to talk about this very important case that involves uh, unions' rights and, of course, the rights of uh, First Amendment rights of people uh, under certain circumstances to decline to join uh, a union. Our, uh, our first speaker is going to be the man in the middle, uh, Bill Messenger. Uh, this past Tuesday, well, Bill has argued actually a couple of cases before the Supreme Court this term, uh, and he was the oral advocate on behalf of Pamela Harris this past Tuesday uh, before the Supreme Court. Uh, Bill works at the National uh, Right to Work Legal Defense Foundation. He is a graduate of Ohio uh, University and the George Washington School of Law. Uh, second will be the, uh, the author of this paper and the man to my immediate left, Andrew Grossman. Uh, Andrew is an attorney at the uh, firm of Baker Hostetler here in Washington, D.C. He's a graduate of Dartmouth College, has a master's degree from the University of Pennsylvania, a J.D. Uh, from George Mason Law School. Following law school, he clerked for Judge Edith Jones in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. He's also worked here uh, for a time at Heritage as a senior uh, legal analyst. He has testified uh, numerous times before Congress. Uh, he is a frequent legal commentator on radio and television, and his articles have appeared in dozens of magazines and newspapers throughout the country. Last but by no means least, uh, on my far left, we'll be hearing from James Shirk. Uh, James is uh, my colleague. He's a senior policy analyst in labor economics here at Heritage. He's a graduate of Hillsdale College, and he has a master's degree from the University of Rochester. And like Andrew, he too has testified a number of times before, con uh, before Congress, is a fre frequent legal commentator, and his articles have also been cited uh, in publications throughout the country. Uh, so with that, let me turn it over to Bill, and please take a moment to join me in welcoming our panelists. Thank you, and thank you for having us here today to discuss this case. Uh, the case, of course, is <clears throat> Harris versus Quinn, and the issue presented is, is it constitutional to unionize home care providers who provide care to persons with disabilities uh, whose care is paid for by a state Medicaid program? And what I would like to do is first sketch out exactly how these Medicaid programs um, operate, who these individuals are, and go through how they're being unionized and what the legal theory of the case is. Uh, this, of course, deals with the Medicaid program. Medicaid provides uh, health care to indigent individuals. It's a state-run program, but uh, jointly administered by the federal government. And here we're talking about home-based care to persons with disabilities in their homes. This includes home-based nursing care, home-based therapy, and most importantly, home-based what's called personal care. And this is assistance provided to persons with disabilities with activities of daily living, such as bathing, getting dressed, eating, things to that effect. The state Medicaid program will pay for this care to qualified individuals. And the relationship between the providers and the state is much like that between any healthcare professional who takes care of someone in a Medicaid program, or for that matter, a Medicare program. 
The state will pay to their services, subject to certain cost limits and such, but the individual has the right to choose who they wished that care to be provided to, much like an individual could choose their own doctor, things to that effect. And here, individuals pick who they want to be their personal assistants. And in many cases, it's family members. Uh, the statistics vary by state, but it's about 50% of individuals choose either a family member or a neighbor to help them with their care at home. And what's happened is, starting in about the late 1990s, um, the unions, uh, primarily the SCIU, uh, decided to attempt to unionize these individuals. Uh, the thinking apparently was, we can unionize public employees under existing law, an existing law we'll speak about in a moment, and so why not anyone who just receives government money, such as a Medicaid provider? And so beginning in California and Washington, but then also Illinois, um, they began to target these home-based care workers. And Harris versus Quinn deals with Illinois' program, so I'll just focus on that. Uh, in Illinois, as I described, the Medicaid program will pay for home personal care. In 2003, uh, Rod Blagojevich uh, became the governor of Illinois. SEIU Local 880 uh, was one of his primary backers. And a few months after coming into office, uh, Governor Blagojevich signed an executive order declaring the SEIU to now be the exclusive representative of all providers in this particular program, about 20,000 of them. Uh, the union was now the exclusive representative of all of them for speaking to the state and dealing with the state with respect to its Medicaid programs, primarily the Medicaid rate. The Illinois legislature effectively codified this executive order soon thereafter. They then signed a contract with the SEIU. The main provision of this contract is that every Medicaid provider, as a condition of providing home care, would now have to pay fees to the SEIU. And a recent FOIA request indicated that the SEIU takes about $10 million a year from this program um, that's intended to provide care with persons with disabilities and takes it for itself, uh, primarily to lobby the state over the Medicaid program. Well, several of the providers um, contacted the National Right to Work Legal Defense Foundation. Uh, the foundation provides free legal aid to individuals um, whose rights have been uh, uh, infringed upon by compulsory unionism, i.e. being forced to join a union. Uh, the lead clients in this case are Pamela Harris. Pamela Harris takes care of her son, uh, Joshua, um, who has some severe disabilities and is reimbursed by one of these Medicaid programs. Also Susan Watts, who cares for her um, adult daughter, Libby. And again, she's being forced to support the SEIU. They contacted us. They did not want to support these organizations, and so we brought a lawsuit. And the theory of the case, quite frankly, is that it's unconstitutional to unionize home care providers under the First Amendment. Um, the First Amendment, of course, guarantees the right to petition the government for a redress of grievances. What that means, of course, is to engage in speech directed to the government. It also guarantees the right to associate for that purpose. So it's because of those two rights that, of course, everyone has the individual to choose if they want to join the Sierra Club or the National uh, Rifle Association, whoever it may be, to lobby the state. What you effectively have here is the SEIU is acting as a compulsory lobbyist. The state is forcing them to support the SEIU to lobby the state over its Medicaid program. It'd be a little different than if the state forced doctors to support the American Medical Association to lobby the state, or nurses, the American ne Nurses Association. So that's, in short, the theory of the case. Andrew will go more into details in a moment on it. Um, so we brought the suit, and the union's defense, however, is that they relied on the case law that allows you to unionize true public employees. And that case is known as Abood versus Detroit Board of Education. It's a case from 1977, and in that case, you're dealing with public school teachers. The Supreme Court held that it was constitutional to force true public employees to support a union, at least as far as its expenses of bargaining with the government, but you couldn't force them to pay for political expenses. Now, exactly what's the difference between bargaining with the government over how a school district is run and a political expense is a fine question, and a question that um, slowly became very central to this case. And so what the union argued is, well, the state pays them, so they're like partial employees in that respect. And therefore, they can be unionized under a boot because the state consider their joint employer or partial employer. Um, we, of course, argued, no, this is compulsory lobbyist, effectively. Uh, we lost at the lower court, the district court, and then at the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, which is um, out of Illinois. We petitioned the Supreme Court took the to take the case, and of course they did. Uh, and oral arguments were held on Tuesday, uh, and the case um, really involves two issues. The first is, should a boot be overruled? 
Uh, we argue that no one should be compelled to uh, pay dues as a condition of government employment, much less being a service provider, and that that is just as political um, as, you know, forcing support for any kind of other special interest group. And then the second fallback argument is, even if the court doesn't agree with that, that at least providers are distinguishable because they're not true employees. They're simply reimbursed by a Medicaid program, and that's not enough of a connection um, to justify unionization under the law. Uh, the argument on uh, Tuesday was quite lively. Um, it, I think the audio will probably be posted sometime today on the Supreme Court website if anyone actually wants to listen. Uh, the transcript is also there. And of course, what they do is only known to the nine justices. Um, we will probably find out in May, no later than June, I would think. And uh, we shall see what they do. Um, but the implications either way um, could be very significant. Obviously, if they overrule Abood, it means that no government employee, much less a service provider, can be forced to pay fees to a union as a condition of keeping their job, or here, taking care of a person with disabilities on a Medicaid program. And even a more narrow ruling that just providers cannot be forced to support a union would itself have broad effects as 10 states have done this. 14 states have tried, four have since repealed. Um, and so there's tens of thousands of individuals being subjected to this type of forced association. And with that, just uh, keep it short, um, hopefully, um, and turn it over to, I believe, Andrew, are you going to speak next? Sure. Um, I'll take the podium. Um, allows me to uh, gesticulate a little bit more freely. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, after oral argument on a Tuesday, I was uh, I was very excited, and um, I'll I'll get into why that is. And um, uh, I, I was I was having a drink with a friend, and you noticed that I was a little bit agitated, um, and so I told him a little bit about the case and about uh, how the oral arguments went. And uh, he had a few questions for me. Uh, he's a pretty bright guy um, and, you know, tends to follow these kinds of things. And so I thought his questions and, and my answers to them uh, might be uh, a good basis uh, for my remarks today. So his, his first question is one that I think a lot of people have when they first look uh, at this area of the law. And that's, what on earth does any of this have to do with the First Amendment? Um, you're talking about labor unions, you're talking about employees and state employees and government relations and so on. Um, nobody's telling anyone really to shut up uh, or anything like that. And so what, what, what does this have to do with the First Amendment? Well, the First Amendment, of course, prevents uh, any law that abridges the freedom of speech, the right to peace, peaceably to assemble, and the right to petition the government for redress of grievances. Um, and here, I think it's those three rights that are, that are at stake, free, free speech, freedom of association, and freedom to petition government. Now, the rights to speak and to associate also include the rights not to speak and not to associate. In most instances, that means the government can't force you to adopt or espouse particular views or to join a group with which you disagree, for example, a political party or an activist group. This also means that it generally can't force you to pay money to fund private speech or to fund private association. So now, what happens when 51% of a group of state employees, let's say they sign a card stating their support for a labor union? Well, in many states, it means that the union becomes the exclusive representative for 100% of those workers, all of them, even the 49% who, uh, who disagree, and it speaks uh, to the government on their behalf. It also means that while workers may not, uh, in every instance, be forced to join the union, they still have to pay a so-called fair share fee uh, to fund its speech on their behalf. It means that those workers are forced to associate with the union and to pay for the union's activities and its speech, whether they like it or not. Now, as Bill mentioned, the Supreme Court really only passed judgment on the First Amendment uh, constitutionality of this in 1977 in a case called Abood versus Detroit Board of Education. The initial remarks, um, it, the court's initial remarks were actually somewhat promising and I, I think correct. Uh, it noted that to compel employees financially to support their collective bargaining representative has an impact upon their First Amendment interests. Well, right, of course. Um, more specifically, it noted, to be required to help finance the union as a collective bargaining agent might well be thought to interfere in some way with an employee's freedom to associate for the advancement of ideas or to refrain from doing so as he sees fit. Now, you'd read that and you'd think, well, they obviously said that nobody could be forced to pay for these things if they didn't want to. But, of course, that's not the way the case turned out. Um, the court held that interference uh, in these rights, uh, some, some degree of violation of these rights, was justified by the governmental interest in promoting a, a concept known as labor peace. 
Now, initially, this was a Commerce Clause doctrine. It dealt with the question of whether Congress had the authority under the Commerce Clause uh, to intervene in labor disputes that threatened uh, to bring inter, uh, interstate commerce to a standstill, things like national railway strikes, uh, big riots uh, among labor groups, things the kind of things where you have people threatening to firebomb factories or firebomb uh, the instrumentalities of interstate commerce, like rail railroad tracks. Uh, in Abood, the concept was used in a somewhat less dramatic sense. Um, it was a teacher's union. Um, so there weren't any fire bombs or riots, or I mean, so far as I know, anyway, it was Detroit, so I suppose that could go either way. Um, <laughs> the court said that a government has an interest in, avo in avoiding the kind of, quote, confusion and conflict that could arise of rival teachers' unions holding quite different views as to the proper class hours, class sizes, holidays, tenure provisions, and grievance procedures, each sought to obtain the employer's agreement. So they're suppressing those uh, dissenting views um, is somehow now equivalent to labor peace, and then that justifies uh, overriding people's First Amendment rights. Now, to carry out the labor peace concept, the government also has an interest, the court held, in avoiding free riders, that is, workers who are subject to, elect to collective bargaining uh, but do not, uh, would not otherwise pay the union for it. Um, that's why workers who do not choose to join a union can still be made to pay fair share fees. Um, so, when home care workers are unionized and forced to pay fair share fees, it undoubtedly infringes on their First Amendment rights. Indeed, the court uh, recognizes much in Abood. The question is whether that's a permissible infringement. So that leads to my friend's second question. So why is this case just about home care workers' First Amendment rights? Why not everybody? Um, why not all <coughs> government employees? Um, and it's true, Abood does apply across the board equally to all government employees. Now, Bill told you about what makes these particular workers, the home care workers, different, uh, why the government's interest in maintaining labor peace for them might well be less, uh, and so probably would not be covered by the logic of Abood. Um, I'm here to tell you that I think there's also another way of looking at it, uh, and that there isn't necessarily so meaningful a, a, a difference and a distinction. Um, the key thing, I, I think, is that the First Amendment interests that are being impacted here are exactly the same, whether you're talking about home care workers uh, who are made uh, to pay a fair share fee and are designated employees of the state, um, or whether you're talking about traditional state employees. Certainly their injury to their First Amendment interests is exactly the same. Um, and I think an example illustrates this. Let's talk about a teacher's union. Consider a teacher's union. What is collective bargaining going to concern? Things like salaries, seniority, tenure policies, benefits, hours. Um, in the end, all these things relate to, gov to government spending, the size of government. It impacts taxes, uh, education policy, and so on. Now, at oral argument on Tuesday, I think Justice Kennedy had a very astute question uh, regarding these types of issues. He asked, is not the size of government a question on which there are fundamental political beliefs, fundamental convictions that are being sacrificed if a non-union member objects to this line of policy? Indeed, he asked, in an era when government is getting bigger and bigger, and this is becoming more and more of an important issue to more people, isn't this an infringement? I mean, consider, for example, recent uh, political activities in the state of Wisconsin. You literally had people in the streets riding over labor policy and spending policies. That's, these are issues that are the subjects of collective bargaining. Uh, to say this is an issue of foremost political significance uh, would be accurate. Um, so the First Amendment interest here is substantial, probably much more so than the court acknowledged in Abood. What about the government's interest uh, in forcing uh, unionization? Well, in two terms ago, in a case called Knox, the court recognized that the free rider explanation was somewhat of a historical anomaly. In every other instance, when the government wants to achieve particular means, it doesn't get to rely on this type of free rider rationale to force people to endorse speech and to pay for speech that they don't want to. Um, that might be a PTA, a parent-teacher association, uh, or it might be any other type of public good that the government seeks to encourage. Uh, it doesn't get to force people to fund speech with which they disagree. Knox also recognized that the regular First Amendment standard of exacting scrutiny applies equally to forced unionization cases as in every other case. This means that the government can force workers to pay their fair share fees only when it's absolutely necessary to achieve the government's substantial interest. Now, Harris presents this broader issue. Assuming the government can recognize a labor union as an exclusive representative of its workers, can it force those workers to pay the union for speaking on their behalf, even when they vehemently object to its speech? This question applies just as much to all state employees as to the home care workers here. So the courts could certainly rule for the plaintiffs in two very different ways. It could find that they aren't really employees and so aren't covered by a mood. 
or it could recognize the board was mistaken and overturn that decision. So I think that leads to, to the third question uh, that my friend had asked, um, his final question. Um, we have a sort of jokey relationship, and he, what he asked was, so bright guy, what's the court going to do? Um, well, I think to begin with, oral argument made pretty clear that the broader question is in play, and that that was really the focus. Um, the Chief Justice, Justice Kennedy and Justice Alito, all asked questions, casting doubt uh, on the fundamental premise of Abood, that the speech at issue is somehow not deserving of the full weight of First Amendment protection. Justice Thomas didn't ask any questions, but there's reason to believe that he likely shares that concern. Oddly enough, in the middle was Justice Scalia. On the one hand, he's recognized that forced unionization and forced supportive speech does impact First Amendment rights. But in another line of cases, he's argued that government officials should be free to hire and fire workers because of their political affiliations. And so that would seem to cut the other way. So in part, this case may turn on how far Justice Scalia is willing to go. There are really three possible outcomes. Um, and they're pretty simple and straightforward. The first is you limit a boot to actual government workers. Um, you know, workers who work for the state or managed by the state or paid for the state. Um, you know, we all have a kind of idea of what an employee is and these home care workers here don't look like state employees. Now, a problem with that would be that it would open the door to circumvention. So there are particular facts presented in this case. For example, the employees were these workers were designated state employees only for the purposes of collective bargaining. Well, maybe some other state would designate them government employees for some other purpose in addition. And so then you'd have to have a case as to how that works out. Uh, it's also somewhat arbitrary. Um, the injuries here and the interests here are exactly the same. Um, on the plus side, the Chief Justice may like it. Um, it's incremental, and it may well get the votes of several of the liberal justices, including Justices Breyer and Kagan. Um, so there could be a, it could build a consensus. And it could potentially set the stage for a, next, for a subsequent challenge that does take aim directly at Abood. Uh, there's already a case pending uh, called Friedrichs in California uh, that raises that issue directly. Um, if the court does go this way, it could rule itself um, as to how this legal issue works out, or it could set a new standard um, and ask the lower courts to figure out how it applies in this case. So there may or may not be resolution, uh, at least final resolution, if the court decides uh, to go this way. The second possibility is the court could overrule Abood. Now that depends on Scalia. He should recognize for the past 40 years, the court has truly struggled to draw a line between charges that are properly germane to collective bargaining, which workers can be forced to pay as fair share of payments, and things that are non-germane. So bargaining is on one side of the line. Things like political contributions are obviously on the other. Everything else falls in the middle, and the court has basically adopted an ad hoc approach. Now, the court needs a new approach, one based on principle. Um, and it should probably abandon what Scalia would surely, abandon, would surely regard rather as a flabby test. And while Scalia has previously relied on unions' duties to represent all workers fairly, and that includes non-members, he may now realize that that doesn't really address workers' political beliefs, and it certainly isn't even true on its own terms. A younger worker, for example, may favor merit pay or defined contribution pensions. An older worker may favor tenure-based pay and a defined benefit pension. One or the other is going to wind up paying for speech that he disagrees with, and that hurts him financially, and it hurts his First Amendment interests. It also depends on the chief. The chief may not view this as being an incremental uh, step, and he may see this as being somewhat radical. I think in truth, though, it truly is incremental. The court has already recognized that there is this line between First Amendment permissible charges and those that are not permissible. This would shift the line, to be sure, far to one side, um, but the court's already recognized the general principle here. Uh, and indeed, the, the consequences of a decision that overrules Abood are likely to be, I, I think at least in the short term, somewhat gradual um, and, and somewhat relatively minor. Um, in a number of states, two dozen, about two dozen now, you have right to work laws, and workers in those states don't have to financially support a labor union. Nonetheless, there are still labor unions in those states. The key is, if the unions provide services that their members find to be beneficial, they'll continue to fund the unions. Um, so the unions may have to work a little bit harder for workers' dollars, but there's not going to be an evulsive change in labor policy overnight. Any changes would be gradual. Um, the final possibility is that the court, of course, could affirm the decision below. My view is that's unlikely, at least based on oral argument. To be sure, it would be a major victory for labor unions because it would ratify the strategy they've used over the past 10 years or so uh, to grow their ranks in the face of declining enrollment in the uh, private sector. Um, so I think in general, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, except to give you um, my, my friend's final response, um, you know, when I'd finished explaining all this to him, he said, wow, Harris is kind of a big deal. Um, 
Yeah, yeah, it is. Thank you. Well, I am uh, not a lawyer, thankfully. I, I'm an economist, uh, which is perhaps uh, an even worse fate. Uh, but I, I am particularly a labor economist. Today is a special day. Today is the day that we get the uh, 2013 uh, union membership uh, numbers. Once a year, the BLS tells us uh, how many union members there are in the United States, and today is that day. And uh, what we saw was basically no change. There was an enormous drop in union membership in uh, 2012. I hit the, the lowest level since 1916 and nothing much changed uh, this year. Now, it's very interesting. You look in the private sector, and the private sector is where most of the drop has been occurring in uh, recent decades. Unions are now down to 6.7% of all private sector workers belong to a union. That's one out of every 15. Uh, by contrast, you go back to the, uh, the 1970s, uh, you know, the time when my parents were getting married, and what was the union density then? It was about one in four in the private sector. So in the past generation and, and a bit, they have lost the, they've gone from 25% uh, density uh, down to a below 7% density. And uh, the reason that's happening is because we're in a, a competitive economy, an economy that's been opened up to uh, deregulation, uh, to free trade with the rest of the world, more uh, you know, competition domestically. And the problem for unions is that they are not competitive advantages uh, for the, the firms they organize. You have a union. You have to bargain every single change to your working conditions with that union. Uh, there's, you're going to be doing that about once every three years. If you need to make a change tomorrow, well, well let's sit down and be a bargain for three or four months. No, 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 we've got a competitor. We have to change things tomorrow. Okay, well, here, let's bargain, and I want something for that. And it's a very slow, sluggish process, uh, on top of which the unions do their darn best to, uh, to raise the cost for the companies. Uh, that's, you know, that's how they try and benefit their members, uh, through higher wages and benefits and uh, through work rules and such that, uh, that benefit the union members who have clout, uh, oftentimes at the expense of the, the organization as a whole. I'm thinking about seniority rules or uh, you know, work rules such that uh, before the bankruptcy in Detroit, you would have over a dozen in many plants different classifications of workers. And you could only do a job if that was your classification. So even if there's just a nut you had to screw in, well, you know, if I'm not that type of mechanic, I'm not allowed to touch it and get the assembly line up and starting. All these things make unionized companies less competitive. And now generally unions try and avoid bankrupting their hosts, but what we see consistently is that unionized companies grow at a slower rate or lose jobs at a faster rate than their otherwise equivalent non-union competitors. And it's about a three to four percentage point a year difference. So over a year or two, it, it, it's not that you, you organize a plant and then go bankrupt the next day. But after 10 years, after 20 years, the unionized plants are going to be a lot smaller. In fact, you, you look at manufacturing, and almost all of the net uh, job losses in manufacturing since the 1970s have occurred among unionized plants. If you look at the number of non-union jobs and the number of union, or sorry, union jobs in the 1970s and the number of uh, union jobs now, down about 80%. You look at the number of non-union jobs in the 1970s, the number of non-union jobs now, and a little bit, but not all that much. Unions are just are bad for the companies they organize. And the, the problem they've been having as of late is they can't organize enough new workers to replace the workers that they've been losing. I mean, it's, it's one thing if you, you, know, you hurt uh, your companies if you can constantly bring in hundreds of thousands of new members a year. But they haven't been able to do that. That uh, polls show that only between a tenth and uh, a fifth of uh, non-union workers say they want a union. And if you think about it, it's not that hard to see why. Why would you want a collective contract in a knowledge economy. By definition, a collective contract ignores your individual skills and abilities and what you bring to the table. Now, in the manufacturing economy of the, the, the 1930s, when a third of the country, you know, up through the 50s, worked on, uh, in manufacturing plants, and we were all doing essentially the same job on the assembly line, a collective contract makes a degree of sense. When you're talking about a knowledge economy, why would someone who's a, a PR specialist or a web designer or someone who works in the service field? Why would they want a contract that ignores their individual talents and abilities, that says you can get promoted at this rate in our seniority schedule, but no faster, no matter how hard you work? Increasingly, what the unions have to offer in the private sector is just not what the workers want. And so that's why academic economists, even very liberal academic economists, find that the, most of the drop in union density occurs because the workers just don't want, to, don't want a union in the private sector. But the government is a, a very different animal. In the government, more than a third of employees belong to a union. 
And that's an average across states. So you've got states like Illinois, where practically everyone in government who's not an elected official or in management uh, is part of a union. And then states like Virginia, where collective bargaining is, is flat out prohibited. In the states where uh, unionization is, uh, uh, is permitted, you've got a very high union rate. And the federal government and in, you know, in the other right to work states, you, you tend to see a, a much lower uh, rate. But in government, the union has uh, re retained its strength. Half of all union members now work in government. I mean, if I were to say to you, think of a union member, what's the image that comes to your mind? Most people would be a guy in a hard hat on a construction site working on the assembly line. You should be thinking the clerk at the DMV or the, the, the guy in the post office. And why has a, a union density remained strong in government? Well, unlike the private sector, competitive pressures don't matter. Government's a monopoly. There is no competition. If you do a bad job educating children in the teachers' union, tough cookies. Where are the parents going to go? So here in D.C., two-thirds of eighth graders are functionally illiterate. And yet we still have the D.C. public school system. Whereas in Detroit, but for our generous you know, uh, you know, taxpayer bailout, GM would have gone bankrupt and would have, you know, you know, would have vanished from the scene. And there, other market share picked up by, uh, by competitors who were, uh, were more uh, reflexive of uh, consumer demands. So government is insulated from the competitive pressures that have just ravaged the, the private sector union movement. And more than that, the unions don't have to actually persuade workers in uh, the government to sign on. All these government unions were formed in the 60s and the 70s. And once they're formed, they stay formed. Unless the workers do the equivalent of a recall election, which is to uh, basically, you know, a one-month window you've got every three years, collect enough signatures to decertify your union, the union just stays in place. So we uh, ran the numbers uh, in uh, September uh, 2012 for Labor Day then, and we looked at the uh, uh, teachers in the, the 10 largest school districts in a number of states. So Michigan, Florida, Kansas, among others. We found that only 1%, one out of 100 of those teachers had ever had the opportunity to vote. Not even had voted for, just had had the opportunity to vote on whether or not they wanted any union. Everyone else had been hired after the union was in place, and as a condition of employment, they had to accept the union representation. You want to teach children in the state of Michigan? You are going to be a member of the uh, American Federation of Teachers or the Michigan Education Association, depending on which uh, school district you live in. It's not even your choice what union you want. You teach in Detroit uh, Public Schools, AFD, anywhere else, uh, the, uh, the MEA. Now, this is a, a certainly nice state of affairs for the unions. They get to collect a lot of dues, don't have to spend a whole lot of money uh, representing the workers, and uh, more or less have a, a captive audience base. Um, but the problem they have is they're continuing to lose membership in the private sector, and they want to expand. They want to reverse this decline. And what they found is they've more or less maxed out in those states that, uh, that allow it, maxed out on their, their government employees. So as uh, Andrew and Bill mentioned, they've, uh, they've turned to a creative new definition of a government employee. Government service providers. Why should someone who runs a, uh, and this is what uh, Minnesota just passed, they have a, a daycare uh, you know, a program. They subsidize uh, daycare for low-income families. So if you're, uh, you're someone, uh, you're uh, receiving welfare and there's a work requirement and you, you know, may not be able to afford uh, daycare yourself, the state will subsidize your daycare so that you can work and you can build up experience and, and you can uh, and, uh, work your way up and hopefully get a higher paying job in the future. But the, the state has now decided, if you run, say, an at-home independent daycare, so we're not talking about a corporate facility. We're talking about, in many cases, you know, stay-at-home moms who uh, you know, you take care of their own kids, and uh, part of the way their family can financially afford to do that is that they also uh, run an at-home daycare business where they look after two, three, four other kids as well, in addition to their own kids. Entirely at-home, you know, you know, there's you know, no other workers except the... Uh, the person who's doing it, they've been licensed by the state. Oh, and you receive a subsidy check. Well, you are now a government employee, uh, or so says the state of Minnesota. And uh, therefore, you are now eligible for unionization. And congratulations, your union can negotiate a contract that forces you to give a, a portion of your subsidy check to the, uh, in Minnesota, it's AFSCME, the American Federation of State County Municipal Employees. And in fact, we'll, we'll do you the favor. You won't even have to cut the check. We'll just garnish it directly from your subsidy check uh, and send that straight to AFSCME. This is what they've done in a number of states, and it's been a tremendous growth industry for them. The, uh, the home care workers, that is a third of the SEIU's entire membership. Of their 1.9 million members, 600,000 belong to these home care workers. This is the reason that for the past decade, the SEIU has been the fastest growing union in the entire United States. They've got California, they've got Oregon, they've got Washington State, 
Uh, they've got Illinois, a number of these states. Minnesota just passed it, although that uh, decision's been uh, stayed, you know, pending the Harris Week win. Michigan, they passed it, and then the, the legislature repealed it. Same thing in, uh, in Wisconsin. So there have been a few states who said, no, this is absurd. Why in the world are you taking money from these people? But this has been a tremendous growth industry for them. And for the unions, it's basically all upside, because in a traditional collective bargaining agreement, in a real workplace, you've got some expenses. You have grievances you have to file. You've got a contract you've got to negotiate and enforce. But if you're representing an at-home daycare provider or a parent taking care of their disabled children getting a Medicaid subsidy check, there's no contract you have to uh, negotiate and enforce. There's no grievances. You know, the, the parent is not going to file a grievance against their child. It's absurd. This is just pure profit to the SEIU. So in Michigan, before they repealed it, it was in place for about uh, five or six years, they took $36 million from the Medicaid reimbursement checks of the parents of these disabled children. $36 million. And there were, you know, your parents complaining about this. There's uh, one uh, person who was uh, quoted in news reports. It was he and his wife taking care of their uh, severely disabled uh, adult son, saying, hey, if you're going to take this money out of our reimbursement check, could you at least come, send someone to come over and babysit him once a month so that we could have a night out to ourselves? <laughs> but of course the union has no interest in doing that. They're simply taking the money from these people, and it's, it's a huge growth industry. But I, I would submit that certainly in these you know, at-home you know, uh, providers, the union has no capacity to benefit someone who's running an at-home daycare business with themselves as their sole employee. That's not what we think about of collective bargaining. And if you can't persuade those people to voluntarily join the union, then they are better off without union representation. You certainly ought not have the government coming in and garnishing their, uh, their, 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 their uh, checks, calling them these bogus government employees, and it's simply taking their money from them. I think it is a, it's a very disturbing trend. Uh, there was actually a, a case in, uh, in Minnesota when they passed this law. The vice president had asked me of the, uh, the, uh, the union who would represent these workers, uh, basically quit in disgust when she saw what was going on. She was the vice president of the union, basically saying, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing her, but I'm not anti-union and I don't want anyone to think I am, but I'm anti what they're trying to do. We are a respectable organization and you know, we shouldn't be trying to use people you know, just to get what we want. We should be out to help people. I mean, it's a paraphrase, but that's the, you know, more or less the sentiment, you know, that we should not be trying to use people. And that is exactly what the unions are doing in these cases. And I, I you know, for all the First Amendment uh, reasons they provided, but also for the, the policy reasons, that I, I very much hope that the Supreme Court strikes down these schemes. Uh, that the unions, what they ought to be doing is modernizing to appeal to workers in the modern workplace doing things, moving away from the traditional exclusive representation, uh, monopoly bargaining where it's one size fits all contract and you're all treated as interchangeable cogs in the, the machinery of production. It doesn't appeal to workers anymore. Do things like arrange networking opportunities for workers, provide job training, which is something the construction trade unions actually do to a, a great extent, but job training opportunities. Things like helping workers manage their career transitions. And when you take a 401k from one company to another company, you know, how do you invest that? How do you, you know, transfer that money over? Provide services that workers in the modern economy would value and would pay for, and then you would see density rise. But don't try and do it by basically having the government come in and take a check out of the money going to uh, the parents of, in many cases, uh, severely disabled uh, children who have a, a tough lot in life. I mean, if that's how you're growing your organization, uh, then your organization ought not exist. Before opening up to, uh, to questions, I would, um, I would note, by the way, that the, the other side, the union, had divided time with, uh, with the United States government. The Solicitor General, Donald Verrilli himself, did the argument, which, you know, that doesn't happen every day, and it certainly sends a signal to the court that this is a case that the United States is taking very, very seriously and that they see this as a real uh, threat to Abood and to to labor unions. Uh, so with that, I'm going to open it up. I have uh, three, three qualifications. One, please uh, identify yourself and your affiliation. Two, keep it short and sweet. And three, end it with a question mark. <laughs> uh, and so uh, with that, uh, does anybody have any questions? We have uh, a microphone over here. Yep, yeah, right there. Hadley, yeah. good to see you. Hadley Arcus Amherst College. Um, Mr. Messenger, I read five, five presentations. Thank you all very much. Uh, I read the transcript, and Scalia is having troubles. Is, you know, is this, a, is this really a petitioning? And of course, I'm wondering, why isn't it possible to go back to what get the argument you really wish to make, which would be Harlan's classic argument in the, against compulsory 
unionization. Moving from the anti-slavery premises, building on that basis, I know we've, um, for me, we've, we've have a concern about the conservative judges talking themselves into uh, historical relativism, historicism. We ask the question, why can't we make the powerful arguments that were made in the past, which are still valid? But I gather, listening to your, your, your presentation, that you probably would have wished to make that argument that's lurking there. But you think, see this as perhaps a step toward it. You'd have to put this in place in order to lead the court in that direction. Am I reading you the right way? If I understand the question correctly, uh, Justice Scalia was asking, if I remember correctly, um, is the right to petition at issue here, meaning are they being denied their ability to petition government? And I believe the answer was, no, that's the speech they're being forced to support. And so this is a compelled speech or compelled petitioning case, not one where they're restricting the ability to petition. I believe his example was um, if the sheriff um, you know, shut the door on the deputy who kept asking for more money. Is that individual being restricted from petitioning? Here we're not saying that the state's not listening. It's rather they're forcing them to support the SEIU for the purposes of petitioning the government. But I gather your, your argument, here your argument was confined to the question of the public, public unions. So like they ask you, would, would, would you, you would still accept the unions in the private sphere? And I gather you said yes. Uh, that's not an issue in the case. That's not an so. issue in the case. But really, your argument, I would take it, the argument you really wish to make, as, as Mr. Grossman suggested, was that your argument would pierce to the very ground on which you would compel people to uh, be, be members of a union, even in a private entity. It could, read, is that right? It could potentially have an effect. There's a few more issues there. Obviously, you don't have the government on the other side of the table. Um, but however, the, even in the private sector, they are being forced to support speech. You know, even if it's is directed to a private employer, and so, um, you know, it's not a complete connection, um, but there certainly is some connection there. So the real, real question is: is compelled association? You know, the the argument was, um, we've established an anti-slavery movement that the person is the owner of his own hands. He doesn't have to justify leaving the job. And this, by the same notion, the employer is every bit as much a natural person as the employee. He doesn't have to justify breaking his association with the employer, with the, with the employee. And it's implicit in the freedom of any worker that he has the right to join a union, to, to join some union. But it's another step beyond that to suggest that they can deprive anybody else of a job for refusing to join their union. In other words, it's, it's tied in with a very compelling system of argument. And um, I just... It's occurred to me as, as listening to you that maybe your argument would sort of set them up to make the next move. But I gather from what you say, you, you really would not, do not think you could make the deeper move right now to sort of go back to the deepest argument you could make against a compulsory unionization. I would say... The argument I think you really want to make. I would say one step at a time. <laughs> um, I, so I read you correctly. Uh, if, if I could... Um, you know, this is, fo folks on the other side, uh, particularly in this case, um, and I guess when I say the other side, I mean from, from the other side, uh, from uh, Mr. Messenger's uh, clients here, um, you know, I've said, said repeatedly that if the court does go full bore in this, you know, it wouldn't necessarily call into question, uh, you know, private sector unionization. And to be fair, that's, that's not really the case. You know, the court can do what it wants to do, and there are any number of ways that uh, private sector unionization can really be distinguished from what's the phenomenon that's at issue here. And, and not only that, I, I would note that those are principled ways. They're not just arbitrary um, reasoning, uh, reasons that the court might put forward. And there is something different when you're dealing with the governments and when you're dealing with public policy than when you're dealing with private uh, individuals. Now, the court could go the other way, too, and maybe there are some broader First Amendment principles. But a, a, a principled solution, I think, is possible in either direction. In the back. Uh, thank you, Jim, uh, Jim Young. Jim, Jim Young, National Right to Work Foundation. Uh, this is for Andrew, because, Bill, I know what you think. Um, <laughs> uh, Justice Kagan at one point, um, <coughs> war see, I believe it was Justice Kagan, warned of the dangers of the radicalism of the position that the petitioners were espousing, which is rather interesting given the end of last term, um, and the side she took. But to what degree, Andrew, do you worry about the things that uh, George F. Will has been writing about this case, particularly focusing on 
the um, lack, supposed lack of incrementalism and um, Justice Scalia's expressed and, and Justice Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts' implicit concern about um, going too far too fast uh, by going directly after the premises of Abood? Well, I mean, a couple of thoughts. I mean, you know, this is obvious, you know, these kinds of issues are at play in any instance where a court is being asked to reconsider its precedents. You know, and the question is to what extent, you know, are people relying on those precedents and sort of how many apple carts are you upsetting? Um, doctrinally, overturning a boob would, would, would really be, I, I, th I think, you know, it would be a very major step. Um, in a certain sense, it would be a major step within the area of labor law. But if you look at the court's broader First Amendment jurisprudence, it's all been trending in this direction for the past two decades. Um, the court has affected, more broadly, a, a unification of many disparate First Amendment doctrines and, and has limited, uh, in a very gradual and deliberate process, the number of exceptions that's been willing to recognize to the broad language of the First Amendment. And you know, in a doctrinal sense, uh, completing that journey, uh, it, it, you know, with respect to force, uh, for, uh, compulsory, compulsory um, unionization um, would be of a piece uh, with that broader trend. And I, I think it would be an incremental move, something the court has been working to uh, for a long period of time. In terms of the practical effects, uh, you know, that's, I, I think that's what Justice Kagan was getting at. And I think Justice Breyer referred to that as well. And it's a difficult question, and to some extent it's empirical, and it's hard to say you know, what could happen. The chief, of course, has made very much of the fact that he sees himself as somewhat of an incrementalist and likes to have uh, cohesion and unity as much as possible in his decisions. I, I think it's certainly possible that if several of the liberal justices are willing to join a narrower opinion, uh, in this case, the result may well be that the court does wind up with a narrower opinion, something that distinguishes uh, the current circumstances, the circumstances of these home care workers uh, from the rule in Abood, uh, while at the same time possibly laying the groundwork for a decision that actually reconsiders Abood. And that could come quickly. Um, we've seen this in other cases, uh, in the, particularly in the First Amendment context. Did you get uh, any sense from the questions of the justices that they were interested in the more narrow ruling, or do you think that there were a fair number of justices that were prepared to jump you know, feet first into the deep end of the pool? Well, gosh, I mean, the surprising thing about the oral argument was the, the extent to which it focused almost entirely upon these broader issues, uh, and, and particularly the viability and premises of a boot. Yeah, sure, there were some questions about the specifics of the program, um, including a couple by the Chief Justice. Uh, but the way those questions were put and the implications of those questions suggested that the broader issue really is in play. Other questions? Hi, uh, Garrett Snedeker here with uh, Professor Arcus at the James Wilson Institute. Um, a lot of the, this is for uh, Mr. Grossman, um, a lot of the focus seemed to be on this concept uh, uh, in law and economics of the free rider problem. And um, it's, it certainly uh, is, is interesting. Um, again, I think a lot of us uh, conservatives, though, would, would be very hesitant to try and replace constitutional principles with economic after effects um, as the um, you know, basis on which a case is going to turn. But since we sort of have gone down that road, um, perhaps it opens it up to, a, uh, you know, to the examination of another principle. If the goal of uh, preventing the free rider problem is to then have the end of successful political advocacy, if you're, if you're trying to pose a question to the unions, how much uh, political advocacy, uh, sort of how much money does it take for you to be successful? Does it mean the uh, continuance of you know, uh, the status quo? where uh, you'll be able to be exclusively at the bargaining table, or um, uh, is it going to be a, a regime where there's actual competition and uh, uh, you know, negotiating with the government? Um, it, it seems like uh, there's really no grounds on which you can judge success, and therefore um, the goal is just to, um, uh, at least for the other side, the goal is just to you know, more or less prevent any sort of um, uh, discourse on this um, and to you know, keep the status quo. Would you agree? Um, no, actually, I would not agree at all. Um, but let me tell you why. I think the free rider rationale is a complete farce. And the reason I think it's a farce is because we have evidence, and it's not flighty or, or, or inconsistent evidence, it's very strong evidence. For the past 
three or four decades, the, uh, uh, the court has tried to draw a line uh, between chargeable expenses that relate to collective bargaining and those that don't. And the ones that don't are all these, or at least many of the political activities that labor unions engage in. So when you hear about a union being involved in electoral politics and that kind of thing, those are generally non-chargeable type expenses. So the so-called free riders aren't paying for those expenses. Well, does that mean that the labor unions aren't a political force? Does it mean they don't engage successfully in electoral politics? Of course not. They engage very heavily, they engage very successfully. In many races, they're the largest contributors. In many races, they provide uh, the most boots on the ground. Um, so I, I kind of just reject the premise of the free rider rationale because for much of what the unions do, there are free riders and the court has held that the First Amendment or statutes uh, require uh, these people to be allowed to free ride on those efforts and yet those efforts in many instances are successful. Um, it's not apparent to me there'd be any reason to believe there'd be any different uh, for unions' collective bargaining activities, particularly when those activities have a more direct impact uh, on the workers who are being asked to pay for them. I, I would also uh, add to that that I mean, it, it's, it's a completely a bogus argument. They have, they have no desire to allow the people who do not receive their services or who are not paying dues to uh, top into their services. What union contracts do very frequently is not simply redistribute wealth from you know, uh, labor and management, but within the workers themselves. So you have a seniority system, which means that the, the most productive and the hardest working workers basically don't get the raises their productivity uh, is earned, and that money gets redistributed to the slackers. The unions, there was legislation proposed would have allowed uh, companies to, uh, to pay uh, basically performance raises without a union's permission. And the unions came out immediately against this and said, oh, this is the boss's pet uh, provision, and you know, we can't allow this. Or similarly, seniority systems guarantee the job you know, security of the senior workers, even if they're you know, completely not fit for their job, by sacrificing the newer hires. The unions have no desire whatsoever to allow the, the newer hires to opt out and negotiate a separate contract that says, how about you evaluate me on the basis of my performance? So in Michigan, which was the, the most recent state to pass a right to work law, the unions were screaming you know, up and down about how awful it would be uh, if you had a situation where you had all these free riders they're forced to represent and oh this is horrible this is horrible you're forcing us to represent these guys and they, they don't have to pass money yeah, what was us and then uh, a few months later after passing it there were some uh, conservative legislators who were like well you know it's not a bad point why don't we say that you only represent your members and uh, you'll be a members only union and anyone who doesn't pay dues negotiates a separate contract with management and it's not under a union contract and the unions were, oh, no, 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 that's not what we meant, guys. No, no, no. I mean, we think free riding's a problem, but not so much of a problem. We don't want it to happen. Uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, it's a, it's a bogus argument. The, the only purpose of the argument is to justify the, uh, basically, the forced dues, in many cases, from the workers they are actively hurting uh, through the collective bargaining process. Other questions? Yeah, back there. I do need to correct something. James Young, National Right to Work Foundation, again, I do need to correct something, Andrew. There is a free rider on the politics. It's, it's the union, because the procedures they follow in almost every state, with few exceptions, Pennsylvania and New Jersey are the only two I can think of offhand. Non-member, and it's the, the question that divided uh, Justices Kagan and Sotomayor and Knox, which, which I litigated, uh, with, from the majority, and that was that non-members are who have remained non-members still have to object once they receive a union's notice so in fact if you're you forget about it you don't get it through the mail you're just a little lazy and you don't send in that objection letter which is usually required uh, to be in writing no emails no faxes then the union is in fact free riding on non public sector non-members who don't object um, and if the court is taking an instrumental, incremental approach, excuse me, uh, that may well be the next procedural step they take if they don't strike down the whole uh, monstrosity uh, of a boot in this case. Oh. If, if you don't like the, uh, the, the free riding on political uh, expenditures example, um, the, the now, you, you should certainly like the, the right to work example. Um, I, 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 I think the point still holds that um, when workers are able to opt out, um, the result hasn't been a complete collapse of a uh, union's political uh, strength. So, you know, the extent to which, you know, may, you know, maybe that's something the court would address in the future in a procedural sense. I think that's probably right. But 
nonetheless, uh, it, it doesn't really seem to have much of an impact on their political activities. Oh, sorry, yes. Al Milliken, uh, AM Media. Does anyone have any observations on uh, union representation of workers in nonprofit organizations? <clears throat> Um, not offhand. I mean, if, well, uh, if you think about, I mean, a lot of, uh, you know, what, uh, their strengths, I mean, you know, government, you know, is a nonprofit of the sort, uh, the, um, uh, many hospitals are a nonprofit and they're unionized. Uh, I think that's all wrapped up in the, the BLS figures, uh, but I, I'd have to double check that. I, that's, that's not something that's been a major focus uh, of attention. I think the woman in the back had a hand up first. And then we'll go to in the second row. Yes, I have two questions. Uh, Mary, my name's Mary Listen. Hashtag listen to Mary on Twitter. And uh, <laughs> a little I have two questions, like I said. And it's, is it James? I don't yes. see very well. Yes. <laughs> Just James. You made a very good presentation. And my two questions. First is, how much money do these unions have? You know, the biggest ones, the government ones? Uh, and what do they do with it? Uh, second, again, that's kind of two-part question. And the <laughs> second question is, did uh, any, um, you know, the, the presentations made to the court, did anybody bring in the, uh, and the Sherman Act, the antitrust, anti-monopoly uh, laws that we have and that, you know, they argue very vehemently in many cases, but why not in this one? Well, answer, answer whichever part you want. Yeah, well, to uh, respond to your questions in reverse order, unions have a special exemption from the antitrust laws. Uh, but for the, they are a cartel, uh, you basically attempting to uh, restrict the supply of labor instead of a, a particular uh, good in the market. So, but for the special exemption, they would be prohibited under antitrust laws, but we've given them that exemption. Uh, to answer your first question, they get an enormous amount of money. Uh, the union movement, uh, it's, it's hard to get a, a total figure because the private sector unions have to report all their, uh, you know, their income and their expenditures. The government unions do not unless they have a private sector member, in which case they fall under the, you know, the same regulations that apply to the uh, private sector workers. The, uh, the Bush administration had attempted to extend uh, the, the union transparency regulations to cover more of the, uh, the government employee unions. And uh, almost immediately after taking office, the Obama administration rescinded those regulations before they took effect. So we think that the, the, uh, the union movement writ large uh, brings in about uh, 15 billion a year, but that's you know, the, only the, the private sector portion of that is, is a real hard figure. Uh, in terms of what they spend it on, uh, whatever they want. I mean, uh, theoretically, they have a fiduciary obligation to their members. At a practical level, as long as the unions aren't actually embezzling that money for their own personal you know, you know, you take a, a, a trip to uh, to Las Vegas you know, just for my personal self. Uh, I mean, as long as they're not actually taking the money and sticking it in their own pocketbooks, there's relatively uh, little enforcement of that fiduciary obligation. So why is giving hundreds of thousands of dollars to Planned Parenthood a, uh, you know, in the best interest of the workers? Well, that's an excellent question, uh, but that's one that the uh, the courts have, have not been asked to, uh, to weigh in on. Um, uh, what we do know is that the, the government employee unions spend much more heavily on politics than the, uh, the private sector uh, unions do uh, because they have the unique opportunity to elect the people they negotiate against. Uh, so that's part of what, uh, what hurt California's finances so badly. The union spent a lot to elect Gray Davis, and then he immediately agreed to bump up all their pensions. And you know, during the tech bubble, told the, the legislature, oh, this will cost nothing, nothing. You know, the rising stock market returns will cover it all. And of course, that didn't materialize, and now the taxpayers are on the hook for allowing many government employees to retire at 55 in California with 90% of their final salary. Thank you, Governor Davis. Um, so the, the unions have a unique ability to influence uh, you know, the, the management in a way that they can't on the private sector, and so they spend very heavily. What we know from the disclosure forms that the, of those government employee unions that have to file the forms, uh, because they represent a handful of private sector workers, they spend about a third of their budget on politics and lobbying that they admit to directly. And then, of course, there's charitable contributions to organizations you know, like Planned Parenthood and such that you might consider uh, allied organizations on the left uh, that, uh, that would be added to that. And so they spend very heavily on politics and lobbying. Uh, in the private sector, it's only about a tenth of their budget goes to uh, the political campaigns, but it is the primary focus of the government employee unions. Let's get the last question over here. Thank you. Cheryl Washington, National Center for State Courts. 
Um, Mr. Shirk, could you expand a little bit on your Minnesota example? You mentioned um, if a home health care provider got a subsidy check that the government or the government mm -hmm. union could take some portion of that. What type of subsidy check are you referring to? And also, mm -hmm. could you talk about whether or not there are any benefits, say, in terms of a wage floor or standards that um, these workers avail themselves to or you know any sort of benefit for that person? Well, there's, there's two programs here you're conflating. One uh, applied to uh, home uh, daycare providers. And that was the subsidy check to the parents of the children in the daycare. If you're sufficiently low income, uh, you uh, basically receive you know, subsidized you know, daycare. And so that was the, the daycare, the, uh, the home care uh, provisions. This is all done through Medicaid. And so it's basically a, a Medicaid reimbursement check. Uh, now, in terms of the, you know, any benefits that are provided, it, it varies by state. That uh, in some states, uh, I believe this was the, the case in Michigan, uh, where basically the, the only thing they were doing was you know, taking dues out of your check. Uh, in other states, uh, basically, they will negotiate with the, uh, the state over the reimbursement rate. Uh, but the, the interesting thing, and, uh, and Bill can talk uh, more about this in Illinois, is that basically, you know, the union can negotiate over what the reimbursement rate is. But let's say you're parents of a disabled child. And, and what they found in Michigan, they did a survey, and they found that three-quarters of the people in the home health care program were looking after either a family member or a friend. So it's, it's primarily not. What the SAU loves to do is you know, trot out nurses and, and health care professionals. Uh, they're a distinct minority of the people in the program. For the most part, it's someone taking care of a, a family member or a friend. Um, and uh, it, and uh, what will happen is uh, that uh, these uh, they organize these guys, and you know you've got a budget basically. So you you know, say it's you know, five thousand dollars or whatever it is in, in Illinois uh, that you can spend. And so you know, on behalf of the disabled child, and that's you know, including the you know, say you know, the home care services other rehabilitation services, you know, other services. You've got a whole bunch of different services that you can access you know, through Medicaid and, uh, in uh, Illinois, uh, but there's a universal cap on how much you're allowed to spend uh, per patient. Well, if the home care union comes in and says, all right, you know, now you, when you're taking care of your disabled child, your reimbursement rate is now going to be X for the hours you provide instead of Y, that means that there is going to be a smaller amount that you then have to, you know, to spend on the other services. So it's not even clear that in many cases the providers of these services uh, would want the, the reimbursement rate to go up if it means that there's less money that they can uh, use to spend on outside services uh, that the, uh, the the children would want uh, or that w would be needed for the, the children and the family members. So in some states, they do negotiate over a, a reimbursement rate, and that's typically how it's done. Uh, but you know, in other cases, you're simply uh, you're in a union for the sole purpose of collective bargaining. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and briefly, I, I just say uh, an interesting fact that I, I ran when I was or found when I was looking at the BLS numbers. It's according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, there are about 90,000 home care workers represented by unions. According to the SEIU, they've got 600,000 members. Where is that difference? What I suspect it is, is you know, if you're someone who works for a professional organization, uh, then of course you're gonna know, you know whether or not you're in a union. But if you're someone who's simply taking care of your disabled child, you probably don't even consider yourself a worker. And you probably don't even know you're you know, in a union and having money taken out by the union. So the BLS comes in and does their survey and asks, hey, are you in a union? And you say, no, I'm not. But in fact, perhaps unbeknownst to you, money from your paycheck is being uh, taken and you know, siphoned off to ask me, or SAU, whichever of the unions. So we know from the SAU's reports that they have 600,000 members in this program, plus however many are, are in the, the other uh, you know, unions. And yet, when interviewed uh, by the, the government in the surveys, it only works out to about 90,000 people saying they're covered by a union. A lot of the people who are receiving these services from the union uh, find them of such tremendous value they don't even know they're getting. <laughs> I, I would note also, uh, since you asked uh, what it is the, you know, the unions do on behalf of these workers, uh, that's actually an issue that came up at oral argument the other day. And um, when the attorney uh, for the labor union in the state uh, was asked, well, you know, there's, there's no grievances because presumably somebody's not grieving against themselves. Um, you know, what, what is it that you do? Uh, the, the response was, well, there's a procedure for if the state subsidy check becomes lost. Um, so, there you go. <laughs> Please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs> Have a good weekend, everybody.